So you're looking at a 1982 Honda Goldwing. This is an 1100cc bike, and I want you to think about that. 1982. That's 41 years ago that this bike was released to the public. And I'm going to cover in this video a bunch of the technology that was available that you might find even today to be impressive if you're a motorcyclist. Now the Honda Goldwing itself is not a special bike. It's a very common bike used by many, many, many people. Uh, typically you're a long distance cruiser. You're looking for luggage capacity, storage capacity and comfort for two people. Modern bikes will have communications options and a lot of fancy gadgetry that'll go along with electronics. The Goldwing market has been on the forefront of the technological market for a very long time. Uh, in the early 90s, you'd have a lot of cassette players, you'd have uh, uh, radios, speaker systems, full fairings that were covered, uh, covering all of your essentials up front and wind protection. But if you'll notice, that's not what this bike is. You have your standard 1980s gauge cluster, has all your basic fuel, fuel information, temperature information, and all the features that you would see in this era of bike. What you don't see though is typical to Gold Wings is a lot of the extra accessories such as the uh, players and radios and speaker systems that you might be accustomed to seeing in some of the other models. Really what Honda did with this Gold Wing is they created a new segment for a very easy riding very large heavy displaced machine. I want you to think back in 1982, this motorcycle is as big as their largest uh, passenger vehicle. And that's no joke, 1100 cc's is the same as their passenger vehicle market at the time. So they took, went from being a four person passenger vehicle with an engine to a one, maybe two person passenger motorcycle with the same engine. Ultimately, you're gonna wrap your legs around the engine that you'd find in a car and drive it. In 1982, that was fairly new territory. What's different about this engine is that where you go from having a vertical cylinder in your standard two-wheel vehicle system, you have a horizontal boxer style, which would be famous through Porsche engine. The cylinders are laid down horizontal. They're used uh, still today in a lot of other vehicle manufacturers. Uh, Subaru and several other motorcycle manufacturers do use these horizontally planed engines. They create a very different feel and most importantly they deal with the center of gravity. Typically when you're riding a motorcycle, center, center of gravity is based on the center of the axles. So if the closer you can get your gravity to the center of the axle, or the center of the wheel, I should say, the, the more balanced the bike will feel. Now typically when you see something like street bikes, you see the riding position, put the rider over the handlebars or they're laying down on top of it to reduce their center of mass because the mass of the engine is so high above the axle centers. There's a lot of different things that deal with this, that, which includes the rake of the forks and the distance of the wheel length. But ultimately, this is a very large, very heavy machine. So the higher you put your weight, the harder it is in order for you to lift it and handle it. And that's a big problem, especially when you're talking about a market that's in retirement in their late 50s, 60s, and on. So what Honda did was they dropped their center of mass very low, and they did it by dropping the motor. Now, to me, it always made sense that a motorcycle should have the air intake in the front and the exhaust in the back so that everything could flow through in the direction you're driving and out the back. And in some ways, uh, motorcycle manufacturers have tried that before. Uh, they were unsuccessful. It has to do with heat management. And so all the hot parts need to face forward and all the cold parts need to suck from the back. But this motorcycle's hiding a few tricks. And let's go over them. It's not exactly what it appears. And this motorcycle itself is gonna surprise a few of you, I know, because the actual stuff that's hiding on here it, from 1982, keep in mind, 41 years ago, is very revolutionary. So the gold wing of this era was actually hiding some super secrets in relation to suspension. With a motorcycle that is this heavy and the technology being fairly new in, in the relation to the period in which it was made, they were having some uh, worries about how to have the suspension operate and function properly under all of this weight. The rear suspension in this motorcycle actually was air ride. 
Yes, you heard me. It was air ride and it was adjustable so that you could manually adjust the pressure up or down to receive the weight that you were going to put on the motorcycle itself. And it affected the handling quite a bit. Now over time, the seals in the air ride system and tend to go, but this one has been upgraded with modern technology because the valving systems have been uh, increased and technology has gone to uh, extreme lengths to be able to adapt. And this is a very common function for these, these bikes nowadays. The rear suspension in this now is, is a manually adjustable suspension where there's no air suspension in it. However, 1982, we had air and that is very cool. Now a lot of motorcycles have their fuel tanks up top here. And I suspect that you think that's what's here. But these cruiser markets, that is not a fuel tank. Airbox, fuse, and a reservoir. So that's it for coolant. So you're looking here, and it's obvious what this is. But the actual fuel filler is down here off a low. This is where the fuel would normally be. The actual fuel tank is under the seat. This is the fuel tank down here. And you can see how it goes down and it goes all the way back here. This thing has a massive fuel tank. But dealing with the center of gravity, it put all the fuel down within the line of the wheels. Meaning that whenever you're handling this bike, despite its weight, it feels very flickable and very light. That is very cool. And something that you don't normally see. This right here is a mechanical fuel pump. Fuel goes in, fuel goes out, and fills the bowls, and it has a return on it. Very simple system. So last but not least, we have my final thing, which is really a, one of my favorite things about this bike, and the thing I hate the most. It's the braking system. Now, this is where the technology of the day fell short of the needs of the motorcycle. When you look at this motorcycle, you would typically find that you would have a, a, a horseshoe, brake system in the rear as a drum. So you'd have a, a hub set drum with uh, horseshoe shaped brakes inside of it that would be drum brakes. In the front you might have disc brakes. This motorcycle is very complicated in how it distributes its brake load. There are two individual calipers on the front of the bike. There's one disc caliper on the back. Yes, it has disc brakes on both wheels in 1982. Again, that's quite revolutionary because most of the bikes of the era had rear drums. Now, some of the issues with the rear drums, especially with something this heavy that you're trying to stop real fast, would be generating heat, and the rear disc brakes are able to de deal with the heat. But what they did with this bike is they tied the rear brakes to the front brakes, uh, and it's kind of a, a hydraulic balancing system. And there's a distribution block that deal deals with this. This distribution block makes it very difficult to bleed the brakes in this machine. It also makes it uh, very difficult to handle this machine in a predictable way. And what I mean by that is typically whenever you push the rear brake, you only deal with the rear brake. But the front left caliper is driven by the same valve that drives the rear braking system, creating a balance. So you don't actually have to touch the front brakes, you can only touch the rear and that balances on its own. If you want to activate only the front brakes, you can pull the front brake lever, but you're only activating the right side. My preference would be that both the front calipers are tied together on the front lever and the single caliper on the back is tied to the foot lever. The reason being is that when you push down on these large bikes and you're trying to get traction, it's best to have more brake on the rear to deliver that traction under power than it is to have a balance. And so separating that balance, which is something maybe that this bike wasn't looked at for doing. If you're doing gravel roads, you get into a bit of a dicey situation where you have a bunch of gravel on the road or dirt on the road. You need to have that rear brake accessible to put a little bit of brake pressure under load so that you'll be able to control the power delivery to the ground much easier through the trifecta of throttle, clutch, and brake. Now, some of you may not know what I'm talking about, but this comes with uh, formal training experience and riding these cruiser style bikes. It's a huge asset and you can make these bikes do things that you wouldn't normally see them do 
if you're aware of how to handle them properly. So I'd recommend that you look into that and maybe we can cover that off in future episodes and discover how we balance that trifecta and what you can do to practice it so that you can get really good. Uh, during my time when I was riding Harleys, we were able to go into a, a drive down the middle of uh, two parking spaces on the center line, enter the parking space with, and then turn around within those two parking spaces with a motorcycle that's this size through the control of the brakes, throttle, and, and clutch. Now the clutching in this is much different than the clutching in the modern motorcycles, so I don't think I'd be able to achieve that same, but I get very close at probably two and a half I get a parking space width with this bike. But I get I do better if that rear brake was separated. And I have been doing some research into separating it, but it's not that difficult. It's just you have to have all your measurements and send them off to get the hoses and delete a bunch of blocks and have a new block for it for the banjos. So I'm not really focused on that because this bike is for sale. It's it works fine the way it is. It just doesn't perform the way that, that I would hope and I, I shouldn't expect it to either. either. One of the other things with this bike is that the engine being so wide, it really restricts you and your movement. So when I sit on the motorcycle, I'm six feet tall. The riding position is fairly comfortable, but my toes want to be forward. And really, my toes are almost in contact with the two rear cylinders of this engine. There's, it's caged because the engine is so much wider than the actual uh, bike that even if you put your foot down, you're not going to catch it before the engine touches the ground and you're going to blow the piece of the valve cover, at the very least, if they touch. So the cage itself will keep that from happening as long as you don't dump it too hard. Having these boxer engines, these horizontal plane engines, it provides you a different input and feel to the controls. You feel like on some of these engines, they're actually single-sided, so they actually only have one piston and they're not balanced. So you feel that whenever you turn the throttle on some engines of different companies, it will actually shuttle the bike and torque the bike to the left. Whereas on this bike, you don't have that shutter and torque. You have a balanced single crank, dual cam engine with split sides on it. You have nothing out of balance here. It actually works pretty good. There's a few upgrades for this engine. You can put some bigger pulleys on it and stuff like that. But for what it is. There's also an aftermarket uh, world for this particular bike. Because the bike itself is split up into four separate cylinders and four different carburetors with one air box, you can also get a kit to, and this is so hot rod, you can also get a kit to put one carburetor on it. And that one carburetor will do fuel delivery for all four cylinders at the same time. Really, it's no different than what's here right now, but when it comes down to it, you can easily adjust and balance the airflow based on the carb kit that comes uh, in that kit for it. I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head, but it is very, very, very cool. Whenever we're dealing with the actual carbs, you have, you're gonna have to uh, consider the balance of them. They have uh, vacuum ports here, so you can adjust them quite easily. You have to pick your primary and stuff like that. I think you balance them right side and then you balance left side se separately so that they come into, in the vacuum together. But whenever you're dealing with this engine, you're ultimately sitting on a Honda Civic engine. Really, it's, it's very similar to the same principles, a carbureted Honda engine. So the transmission's back here, the clutch basket's back here. If you turn this thing up and turn it sideways, it would look like a Honda Civic engine of the era, just a uh, double fat and double wide. The carburetor systems are, uh, work excellent and I haven't had any issues with the, any of these and they're very easy to rebuild. They're quite easy to take off because there is no fuel tank above them. The actual trim pieces are easy to take off and I am gonna take them off in order to replace the choke cable here later today. One of the most important things about this engine is keeping up on its maintenance and just giving a good look over, make sure there's no vacuum leaks so you don't get any air running, but ultimately it's a bulletproof engine. Getting aftermarket parts, it is possible. There's still all the cables, all of the uh, uh, standard gasket kits and uh, some, a little bit of hot rodding kit stuff. Uh, but when you buy a bike that's 40 years old, you are into the flea market purchasing scheme. So you're looking for other people who have done things and you're looking for things to modify 
this bike because the cases are no longer built. If you uh, crack a case or do anything like that, you just can't go buy it off the shelf. You have to go aftermarket and you have to go used. That's the same with anything else. But you shouldn't be afraid of this bike. This bike is super reliable. This one here has 64,000 kilometers on it. It's only, what's that, only 30 some thousand miles. This thing has another 100, 150,000 miles in it before you'd ever give up the goat as long as you keep up on your maintenance. Now, the aftermarket segment for this particular bike, and this is one of the most interesting things about it, is that you'll notice that the rear saddlebags don't have a topper. Now, there was a topper that went with it, and you'll notice it from if you look up the Aspen cake. But the Aspen Cade had a full fairing birdhouse on it. And the full fairing came with the Aspen Cade. There was also a box up here, a helmet box, and then you had your two trunks below. This is a city style bike. This came this way from the factory. They're built this way, and many of them will, you'll find are stripped down without the uh, saddlebags on them either. The fully built gold wings with the full fairings and stuff like that. They came up at the same time. You can do those as well, but I found that the fairings on them are quite ugly and the way that they house the front headlight, it was always nicer to see it out front. This was probably the prettiest version of this era and model of bike that I've ever seen. And really, when it comes down to it, in, in its current form, it's almost perfect to what modern standards would be besides the braking system. I'm, I'm just, a little bit devout in changing this over if I was going to keep it. You don't have to. Now, <laughs> why would you want to buy a bike like this when you can just spend a whole bunch more money? If this bike's been around for 40 years, it still starts and runs without issue, you're, you're in a whole different category. carburation, a little, little fuel management, you can just make this thing just be crazy. Anyway, cool bike. If you're going to buy a GL 1100, don't be afraid of it. Get on it, ride it, try it, feel it out, and see if you like it. For two grand, it's worth it.